Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, The ABCs of Immigration, updated for 2020. Before we dive into today's presentation, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. First off, this webinar is being recorded and all attendees will receive a recording tomorrow via email. And they'll also receive a copy of the slide deck as well as the SHRM and HRCI continuing education credits. During today's presentation, we encourage you to ask all the questions you have. Um, you can do so by using the question feature in GoToWebinar. We are anticipating a lot of questions. This is a really popular webinar that we do every year. So we'll try to answer as many as we can. However, please keep in mind that we cannot answer any case or company specific questions and you should instead consult with your immigration attorney for those questions. Now for anyone who may not be familiar with Envoy, for nearly 20 years Envoy has been on a mission to fix the inefficient, frustrating, and confusing immigration process. Envoy combines expert legal representation with innovative technology to deliver the only platform that makes it seamless for companies to hire, mobilize, and manage a global workforce. We secure work authorization in 150 plus countries. We've grown 33% year over year, and we work with over 1,000 customers. Uh, we are particularly proud of our MPS score, which is a testament to the employee experience we provide. And I'm very excited to welcome today's presenter, Sarah Herbeck. Uh, welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. Sarah is the managing partner at Global Immigration Associates, which is Envoy's affiliated law firm. Um, in her role at GIA, she provides strategic immigration advice regarding the movement of professionals throughout the world. She oversees 80 plus attorneys, paralegals, and support staff. Uh, she graduated with honors from Northwestern and has her JD from Chicago Kent College of Law. Thank you again for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Erin. So as you can see, we'll be covering a lot of great material today. We have a whole ABCs of visa categories to cover, if you will. So Sarah, let's uh, dive right in. Actually, first, one last thing. Before we dive in, please note that content in this presentation is not intended as legal advice, nor should it be relied upon as such. For additional information on the issues we discussed today, please consult your immigration counsel. Uh, so, Sarah, let's start off at the top of the alphabet with the B-1 Business Visitor Visa. What can you tell us about this visa and when it is most commonly used? Certainly. Uh, the B-1 Business Visitor Visa is utilized for short-term trips to the United States uh, to help further and business purposes uh, for foreign entities, right? So you're looking at wanting the benefit of the business visitor trip to benefit their uh, working abroad. You want to avoid it benefiting <laughs> the United States uh, as that sort of defeats the, the purpose to a certain extent. However, in multinational companies, it'll eventually make its way back to the headquarters if the headquarters are in the United States. Um, so there's that sort of statement. However, uh, you also it's also used <clears throat> particularly for meetings, seminars, conferences, and having employees come to be trained uh, with the caveat that their training and the results of that training will not end up in the U.S. market. And so we're trying to make that separation between coming in, benefiting that, that foreign, say, subsidiary employee coming in to be trained mm -hmm. on business processes for the company or this is how we, how we do things here, so say at Envoy, and then heading back home and applying that knowledge that was that was learned to do their job. And yeah, it's it's a it's a great op option. Uh, you definitely need for most for countries that require a B visa, you have to go to U.S. consulate. You have to get the visa. Uh, once you secure that visa, you can then utilize the visa even if the initial purpose is not the same, assuming that you have a multi-entry, multi-year B1 visa. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of the items that are particularly important um, are making sure that you can demonstrate your visit is temporary, 
you fully intend to return home and that you're not going to continuously remain in the United States, despite the fact that you are eligible to extend the mm -hmm. D1 as, on an as-needed basis. So there is a validity period. Yes, uh, you're not entered, you don't enter the United States for as long as you would like. <laughs> Typically, it's a six month entry uh, for extensions up to one year. Certainly encourage individuals who are in the United States for over six months to ensure that they speak to a tax professional, which mm -hmm. is not my area of expertise at all, uh, just to make sure that there are no tax implications for ongoing training in the United States, mm -hmm. and just making sure that they're aware of those items. Okay, and then you had touched a little bit on the eligibility criteria, but could you dive into that a little bit more? Sure. Um, again, the fundamental purpose is not coming over and doing your job, mm -hmm. but coming over to, say, learn or participate in events that will ameliorate your position abroad. And that, I would say, is the focus of it being in a is how they're going to focus how a u.s consular officer could potentially look at what they're doing uh, focusing on temporary focusing on how it's going to impact their life back in their home country how it's going to impact their job in their home country and if you can rationalize and put all of those items together it 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 helps tell the story as to why you qualify for to be one in particular mm -hmm. it's pretty highly scrutinized particularly in certain countries and so you're looking at making sure that you're prepared. It's probably the most important part, having a schedule, having an understanding as to what the specific needs are and what the specific activities are that you're going to do in the United States. Now, as we know, you can fully intend to do, you know, have a very specific schedule mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. Things change. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so it's not as though you're, it's a written in stone situation, but I think that you need to have an outline uh, particularly what your goals are, what you're setting out to accomplish, how you're going to do that, what you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And the more detail that you have, particularly if you're filing for a new B1 visa, the better off you're going to be. It just shows that you're organized. So the more detail you can provide, yes. the better. Yes. And being able to back that up. Great. So that brings us to the visa waiver program. Um, what can you tell us about that? The visa waiver program is actually super beneficial to those individuals who can participate in it yes. because you don't have to visit a U.S. consulate abroad or embassy abroad to obtain a B-1 visa to enter the United States for business purposes. It's actually also, it, with its ease, comes it's a little more restrictive, meaning typically entered and admitted for 90 days mm -hmm. as a visa waiver uh, applicant. You are then have to leave the United States within that time frame because you're not able to extend, nor are you able to change status. And so it is a little more restrictive uh, with the ease up front. Mm -hmm. And so that would be sort of where I would stand on that. So can you only apply for it once? Like you're in and out, or could you? So every time, there are certain restrictions to to the the visa waiver program. There are certain individuals, though, even though they are from countries that participated in it, mm -hmm. if certain if they participate in certain activities, they might not be able to obtain or utilize the visa waiver program. What you need to do is just make sure that you're cleared through ESTA, um, mm -hmm. and that is that is how you know that you've been pre-cleared to enter the United States using the visa waiver program, which is a similar status to the business visitor or even um, you know your vacation or in the United mm -hmm. States. Okay. Helpful explanation. So our next category is the E-Treaty visas. Um, the U.S. maintains commerce treaties with various countries, and as a result, USCIS grants work authorization to nationals in these countries to encourage trade and business. What can you tell us about the eligibility criteria for Visas. The eligibility criteria for these visas is having that ownership come out of a foreign country into the United States and have that investment be from a for, from a, either a foreign entity or a foreign individual and invested in the United States. Uh, this is a bit unique. Uh, this is is 
a benefit to certain individuals that are from those countries. So take France, for example, a French-owned company that makes an investment in the United States and say a U.S. subsidiary, mm -hmm. and being able to demonstrate that we'll be able to participate in using an E2 visa, and we'll be able to to move to the United States those French employees. So whether or not they're born in France and have French citizenship or have accumulated uh, French citizenship along the line. Don't know how to do that. I'm not a French citizen. Um, but if they were, once they have their French citizenship, they would then be able to, assuming they qualify with the position, send those 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 French citizens to the United States on mm -hmm. E2 visas. Okay. It's citizenship based. It's a unique citizenship base, but it's certainly tied into the investment that the foreign individuals or companies are making into the United States. So it's unique and certainly a useful tool, particularly for companies and even investors and individuals who want to utilize um, this particular visa and get, you know, you, you don't have somebody who we're going to get to L later, I know, has worked at your foreign subsidiary for over a year. <clears throat> so it's, it's definitely unique. In that aspect, I think that um, the jobs themselves also that relate to E2s are a unique opportunity to bring in experts. Say you're a French automobile company and you want to bring in your auto experts, but they're not from a French automobile company. Mm -hmm. They might be from an American automobile company that has has a business in in France, you know, and it's sort of the reverse of what you would expect yeah. to have happen. Okay, okay. Um, and then I think next, yes, just for those who aren't familiar, if the countries it includes, um, anything else to add? No, nope. I think that it, it is a super useful tool, and I think that uh, the types of positions that come out of it um, are, are those that are practical and they make sense. So your managers, your executives, those individuals with industry knowledge that may not have actually worked at a foreign country for over a year, but are individuals that are experts within their field or leaders within their field, and then ultimately useful for, um, you know, your U.S. enterprises. Great. I think next up, oh, <laughs> sorry, more e-treaty slides than I remember initially. <laughs> so, but you've already touched on all of these things. Yeah, so it's just two years. Uh, and one of the nice things about the e-visa is that if you have a visa that's valid for longer than two years, as long as an individual access to re-enters within that two-year time frame, they should be admitted for a full two years after the fact. So it's not only useful, it's also cost-effective. So then moving on, how is the E-2 different from the E-3? So much like the E2, where it's similar, is that it's citizenship-based, uh, but this time the E3s are only allowed for Australians, and then they have some additional caveats that the E2 would not have. So you must be offered a, or the, excuse me, the Australian citizen must be offered a specialty occupation in the United States. Specialty occupation is one that requires a, the job itself requires a specific degree, bachelor's degree at least or its equivalent in a specific field, and the individual E3 recipient would need to have that bachelor's degree or higher um, or, and its equivalent in, in that specific field or related field. So think an industrial engineering position being offered and an individual uh, Australian citizen who has an industrial engineering bachelor's degree. So that was really straightforward and simple, but that's the, the sort of premise behind it. So then, We'll get to the H-1B later, but this sounds like it could be potentially a good alternative for Australian citizens because of the specialty occupation that it has in common with the H-1B. Right. It is very similar. They're just not the limitations. Yep. It's, these, it's available at all times, but the one big limitation is you have to be an Australian citizen. Fair enough. Um, so moving on, as I just said. The H-1B, which I'm sure a lot of employers are very familiar with, let's start by going over the eligibility criteria as this is, you know, one of the most highly sought after visas and one I know that we it certainly is. talk about quite um, often. 
It, it certainly, certainly is. Uh, it's also limited. Uh, where the ease and the ease that we just discussed, there's not that specific limitation. There's not that oversubscription, so to speak. Uh, H's are are in that where seemingly there are individuals who would qualify for an H1B that wouldn't get one because of oversubscription, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But much like the E3, the idea behind this is that it's a specialty occupation, which very with the base level means professional, mm -hmm. but more specifically means the job must require at least a bachelor's degree in a specific or related field, and the individual must have a bachelor's degree or its equivalent in that specific or related field. Keeping it really simple, <laughs> it's a bit more complex than that. Anybody in who in the immigration space who works with H-1Bs understands that the environment has also gotten a little more difficult as well, uh, under, necessarily understands that and knows that I just simplified it completely. <laughs> but, you know, in theory, that's what you would need. Uh, typically, they are, they are, excuse me, they're, they're location based, specific location based, specific job based, a specific salary based, having a labor condition application support the H-1B in a labor condition application, for those of you who don't know, is is a form that's filed with the Department of Labor that where employers who are sponsoring an H-1B attest that they are paying um, appropriate wages, essentially. So at least the prevailing wage or actual wage for the position being offered. And so there are a lot of moving pieces when it comes to putting together an H-1B. So it, saying that it's just a degree and a requirement mm -hmm. is simplifying it, but it's gotten more complex in the last couple of years. Uh, with the level of scrutiny that this particular visa category has. In addition to the fact that there are, when I mentioned earlier, oversubscription. Mm -hmm. So we are gearing up for our cap season this year. That's exactly what I was going to go into next. Yep. And what I mean by oversubscription is, is there are a limited number of H-1B visas available every year, 85,000 or just under 85,000 whereby 20,000 of those are specifically set aside for individuals who, have individuals who have received at least a master's degree or higher from a U.S. institution. And that typically uh, is completed and selected beginning April 1st. Our timelines are a bit expedited this year because USCIS is implementing a new process. And ultimately what it comes down to is as you can see with the numbers, they're oversubscribed. So you're looking at a visa that potentially all 200,000 plus individuals would qualify for, mm -hmm. uh, assuming approval at USCIS, but only 85,000 actually being able to benefit from. So that's a, you know, <laughs> chances aren't great in yeah. getting them. And with the new H-1B cap process and you know, I guess we'll find out what those numbers really look like yeah. this year. So speaking of, um, employers may or may not be aware there was a significant change to the lottery uh, very recently, which was electronic registration. We actually just, we've had a couple of webinars about this over the last couple of months. So for those who have not heard about it or maybe didn't attend our previous webinars, what's, what's changed and what is the new process and timeline for this year's cap. So as I mentioned, we're a bit expedited this year, or at least everything's moved up a month. So traditionally in the past, all H&B cap petitions would be filed within the first five business days of April mm -hmm. because it's oversubscribed, and then a lottery would ensue, and you would find out about two or so months later whether or not you were, you were accepted into the cap. This year, uh, through the electronic registration process, instead of April 1st being our trigger date, the first date is actually March 1st, which is a Sunday, uh, <laughs> beginning at 12 Eastern. The registration process will open up and it will continue to be open through 12 Eastern on March 20th. And at, during this time, in, attorneys and their clients will be completing the registration process uh, for individuals that have been identified by those companies who ultimately need an H-1B to continue employment. The information then, once compiled and submitted, will be placed into what we would expect to be a lottery. Uh, if it's not, 
if less than 85,000 have been submitted, I would be super surprised. So I do expect it, much like in the last several years, for the registrations to be oversubscribed, such that they need to enter into a lottery. The lottery is then set to take place and be completed by March 31st, such that all individuals will be notified so that they can ultimately send in the H&B petitions for receipt at USCIS beginning April 1st. So essentially, electronic registration is like the pre-lottery. Correct. To get you into the lottery to then determine whether or not you actually submit the paper instead of just submitting the paper up front. Got it. I'm sure you are fielding many, many questions about that yep. uh, pretty regularly. So now that we're up to speed, um, let's take a look, a little bit closer look at the validity period and some of the other like qualifying material or qualifying components of the H-1B. And then after that, we'll do the H-1B one. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. H-1Bs, I think, are most, most visas when issued or status uh, when changed, there's a limitation to the time, right? Mm -hmm. And in this instance, we're looking at typically you get three years. Uh, and then you can extend in three-year increments. That's, that can happen. Uh, USAS can shorten that validity period if they so choose. Okay. Uh, it just depends on the employer-employee circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one, as you can see, is very different than what we had previously talked about. So the E2, you're, you're saying two years. Mm -hmm. uh, but then if you travel, you kind of get this automatic extension. H1Bs, once you get that H-1B and you have your validity dates, you have to file with USCIS. So it's not as simple as just exiting and re-entering the United States. I wish it was, but uh, <laughs> not so much. Um, okay. So then H-1B ones, much like going back to citizenship, USCIS certainly likes its citizenship-based visas. Uh, H-1B ones, much like the E-3s and the H-1Bs, has that professional specialty occupation requirement. So that's just the... The, the first level of review. Then you also need to be Chilean or Singaporean. Uh, one of the perks of the H-1B one is that you can actually apply at a U.S. consulate abroad and be admitted for 18 months versus applying through USCIS. So it's a bit expedited. Um, that's the same for E3s, I should make a note as well. And it's, it is a very nice process. It's a, you don't have to go through USCIS. You can have a little more control over when things get adjudicated. You could essentially make a consular appointment and bring your paperwork, come and get a reading or yes. a, a ruling that day. Correct. Correct. Uh, the consular officer say yay or nay. Uh, you could also go through USCIS, but from a cost efficiency perspective, it's typically faster to go through the U.S. consulate or embassy abroad for the E3, for the H1B1, and depending on the next visa category that we look at, potentially that too. So I guess uh, it, we're looking at uh, these being very similar, so they look a little bit like an H1B, but they're just a little bit different uh, to provide a little more flexibility, but at the same time, there's such a narrow scope as to who is eligible mm -hmm. because it's citizenship-based that you're limiting your pool. And is there a cap on the H1B1? It's all... It's there. There, there's a cap because certain ones are set aside uh -huh. through the H-1B cap, but it's, it's not it's met. met. I haven't seen it be met. Um, apparently, Singaporeans and Chileans aren't, you know, raring to come to the United <laughs> States. But you know, I, I've not, I've not uh, had the privilege of visiting either one of those countries. So I suppose I'll have to go and check them out. But yeah, they are. It is interesting because I know we have a few more citizenship-based visas coming up. And I think that certainly there's a huge benefit when you mm -hmm. when you are citizens to allow for flexibility. Great. So next is actually what I think is one of the more interesting visa categories, uh, okay. the L. I think also a very popular option for employers. So what, let's just dive right in, L1 intercompany transfer. Right. So L1s are for multinational organizations whereby a foreign individual has been employed at uh, an entity abroad. So when I say abroad, outside the United States, mm -hmm. 
for at least one continuous year and has worked in an executive, managerial, or specialty, or excuse me, specialized knowledge occupation, and then intends to come to the United States and work for a U.S. parent subsidiary affiliate in a, an executive, managerial, or specialized knowledge occupation. Mm -hmm. There's no cap. If you, there's a, there's a method and a way that for larger organizations, you can actually apply at the U.S. consulate and um, circumvent going through USCIS to speed things up a little bit. And it's certainly beneficial for companies who need to move their experts around. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a great visa, particularly since it is all kind of tied to you know, four big multinational organizations, they are probably moving their, especially executives, mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a, it's an important learning tool, understanding who your people are and, and what is, especially for executives, like where they need to be placed so that they get the experience so that they can potentially lead in the United States. Great. Um, the L, so there's three, right? Mm -hmm. Three different types. Well, there are two different types. Uh, executives and multinational managers fall under the L1A, and then special specialized knowledge falls under L1B. Let's talk first about the L1A <laughs> okay. and the L1B, sure. and then and then the blanket. Okay, so L1A, multinational managers or executives, and I think it's important to point out, and when you're looking at managerial capacity, it is your traditional manager, people manager. However, it's also your function manager. It's you know your finance manager who is really into driving the financial health and direction of the company, but doesn't really have anybody reporting to him or her. Mm -hmm. That person could potentially be a function manager. So you've got a little opportunity and growth to look at the types of managers you could potentially bring over. And obviously, an executive. I think everybody yeah. can understand who that is. Correct. You know, your HR directors, VPs, presidents, your CEOs. C level. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Those individuals who are really at the upper levels of an organization who direct the organization. And the way that I always like looking at it is the level of control and influence within a company, as well as budgets and revenue generators. And so there are there are ways to describe sometimes it's really hard to describe a function, right? Well, describe it and then then think about how much revenue it generates. That helps talk about its importance. Um, how much budget an individual has mm -hmm. to influence the organization, how much control they have within the company. And it's all relative. And so it's all very interesting when you're putting the puzzle pieces together to make a determination as to how you may want to proceed for a specific individual and you're just not quite sure having that information is always has always been useful for my clients. So then the uh, more on the qualifying criteria, it looks like initial stay, one year renewals um, given in like two year increments, and yes. you can stay for up to seven years. That is correct. And it's anytime, I mean, some, for some of your international CEOs and presidents, they're traveling all over the United States. So mm -hmm. I think one of the perks in that seven year time frame is any time spent in the United States doesn't or excuse me outside the United States can be added on to the seven years, okay. and that's how that works for any time spent in a in a visa category that is time sensitive. And what I mean by time sensitive is it has a time limitation. And so again, very useful tool for those executives, particularly if you've got their career paths paths out, right? So maybe the headquarters is in Spain. And they need to come to the United States to really understand the culture because that's one really important part of the company mm -hmm. before they step in and, and take the helm as a CEO in the home country. Great. Great example. Mm -hmm. Oh, specialized knowledge. Um, it, it's your, it, the simplest way to put it is your subject matter experts within your company. I was going to ask, how do you like prove yes, and show specialized exactly, knowledge? Exactly. You can't say 
person is a snowflake within the organization. Uh, that that isn't serious enough, obviously, and I, I don't mean to joke because the special specialized knowledge is exceptionally important. Mm -hmm. um, think of it as knowledge that would only be learned within the company, or think of it as knowledge that the individual is so experienced in a specific industry at the height of his or her game, and they've been working at your company and, and made all these innovations, and they're coming to disseminate their knowledge in the United States so that all the individuals in the United States can also benefit from this knowledge. So it, it really it really is those, I guess, maybe more on the ground leaders than actual designated as a manager or as an executive, but those who are at the forefront of innovation and technology within the company. Great. And now the reason I think the L is so cool is because <laughs> of the blanket. I think it's such a it's such a great resource uh -huh. that companies can take advantage of if they're eligible. I cannot disagree with you at all. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there is a way to have the to re to receive an L1, much like in E3 and E2 and H1B1, where you just simply go to the consulate and you're able to circumvent going to USCIS, saves time and money, and is typically is makes the process that much more seamless and the L blanket is a super useful tool for multinational organizations that are moving people around mm -hmm. and one of the places is the United States obviously so you've got to be you know engaged in commercial trade so doing business um, and and having been in business in the United States for over one year as at least three domestic or foreign related entities and then there's a financial component to it I think the one that I typically see the most is um, the second bullet point um, of having that annual sale of at least $25 million, um, in the United States. And that's where you typically get that, uh, and that's what we typically see. The first time a company applies for an L1 blanket certification, mm -hmm. essentially, you get three years. And then assuming that you can continuously demonstrate that you meet the qualifications, they're then approved indefinitely. And it's super convenient, uh, you know, not to make light of it, it is very, very convenient for employees to, to be admitted to the United States. And the one also nice thing is, is if there is a case where, you know, you might think, well, maybe not the strongest, but we think that they qualify, so we're going to give it a try. Mm -hmm. If you apply at a U.S. consulate abroad and the L1B is not approved by the U.S. consulate, you actually have the opportunity to go to USCIS just for a double check, which I think is, is very, very nice. Um, obviously, <laughs> not what you would want. Yeah. But it, it's it's having that backup option available, uh, which is nice, particularly for those individuals that there, there's been a specific business-related reason to bring them to the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and having a backup option, at the very least, while it's not expected or anticipated, it certainly, it certainly at least gives the individual employees, uh, okay, well, if uh, if worst case scenario happens, at least we've got a backup. Mm -hmm. And I think that that goes a long way, particularly in this day and age when it comes to the environment uh, and Lots the level of scrutiny. Of yep. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you for that. So moving on, the next visa is the O-1, which is for individual individuals with extraordinary ability mm -hmm. um, designed for extremely special employment cases so they apply to a very very specific set of workers uh, what criteria do foreign nationals need to fit in order to get an O-1 visa so there are the, the sort of the easiest one is you've won the, an international prize so I like think Nobel Peace Prize okay mm -hmm. however that's not everybody, and that's a very, very small group of individuals uh, in the in the world. And so there are also other criteria that can be met. Uh, three needs to be demonstrated, but I think the one that we typically see is top top of your industry or mm -hmm. or field of expertise, uh, being published, uh, being cited, uh, being a peer reviewer, uh, or sort of a go-to expert within the the field or industry that you're in and in kind of working that's what mm -hmm. we typically say highly compensated and probably and lots like. of professors yeah professors but you know when in a world where say 
you need to get an executive over to the United States now. They don't have a citizenship-based visa. They haven't worked for an organization for over a year abroad. And H-1Bs are, you know, H-1Bs yeah, aren't available for, for another sure. eight months, just under eight months, I should say. And there's no, no guarantee of it being, of the, of the H-1Bs being selected. What are you going to do? Well, O-1 is a useful tool for that. So it's not just your mad scientist. It's mm-hmm. also your mad executive. <laughs> and, mad as in brilliant, not a... <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, not as in the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, thank you, Disney. Um, but there's, it, it's it's super useful. Uh, I've worked with clients and utilized that in the past. Uh, it is very work intensive, however, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it is also an area or a visa application or a non-immigrant status where it's hard to sometimes set timelines with your clients because a lot of the work that you do is reliant upon outside references to support the petition itself. And so it's certainly a unique situation uh, that is super useful, but it's also very important to upfront have the conversation. Mm-hmm. We need to make sure to have conversations with clients about this. This is not going to take two weeks. So, but then if you were successful, there's no maximum. Like, yeah, there's not a limitation like there is for an L1 or an H1B. They're, they're sort of indefinitely renewed. But I mean, I think to a certain extent that makes sense because these individuals are so top notch. Telling them that they only have a limited time frame to remain in the United States seems contrary to the fundamental point of the visa itself. Mm-hmm. So very practical. So that's a, a very it's a useful tool. It does take some legwork, and I think that if the individual him or herself qualifies, it's certainly a viable option for those individuals, especially when you're looking outside of H and B eligibility and the like. Great. So I think next up is the P visa, which, mm-hmm. as you can see, is for artists, entertainers, and athletes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what can you tell us about the very talented individuals? It's sort of related yeah. to the O. Like- so you know, you you've got your 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 athletes who are you know internationally recognized in the sport in which they're participating. And they need to be coming over for a, you know, for a specific purpose. And then, you know, it also could be somebody who's coming from, a, you know, say, Japan to play baseball. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so for in Chicago, let's just say for the Cubs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just sort of looking at the options for that. Um, and then also, if somebody is coming over for the Cubs, I would then maybe revert back to um, you know, some other visa options because I, I would say for the Cubs, people might disagree <laughs> at the top of their game. Um, but it's just, it, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting way. I mean, look, I think everybody can look at what's going on in the world of sports and I'm not as huge, like go sports person as I, I think everybody can tell by just what I said, but look, there was a football game in London. Mm-hmm. There are now, like, soccer is becoming huge in the United States. And not just, not when I was growing up, it was just sort of youth soccer, what is it? And it just wasn't mm-hmm. as big of a deal as it is now, or it wasn't as mainstream. So we are getting athletes coming all over just to simply play in, for sure. for, you know, for the mm-hmm. for the organizations that, are widely popular in the United States and worldwide. And I'm sure with even like transferring from team to team, say a team in a different country, I'm sure mm-hmm. it becomes applicable then as well. Yeah, looking at it's 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 a nice option for for those athletes who who need to come to the United States and need need to be able to do their jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, their job is soccer. Their job is football. And so it's it, their job is hockey. I mean, sort of sports. Yeah. Um, so. We see it as a um, something to watch on TV or exactly. go have a leisurely afternoon, but for them it's their job. employment. Exactly, exactly. So it's and when you are working in the United States, you're foreign national. You need work authorization. Got it. To be lawfully employed. So, 
for the artist or the entertainer, it's the piece three. Mm -hmm. How much does that differ in terms of like validity period and eligibility criteria? Well, it's that initial stay of one year and then it varies. But again, these are individuals who are at who are at the top of their game, who are well known. Mm -hmm. Now, I would I think that the medium these days with how well known an artist is is actually something that is a lot more like you can identify it as you know these Instagram stars who are singers mm -hmm. and YouTube and the like where you can actually see the followers and where they're from and run that statistical data. I mean that's statistical data and influence is mm -hmm. huge because mm -hmm. that's what you need to prove. Your sort of your footprint is larger yeah. than just your your home, yeah. right? And sure. I think that that's been an interesting part of this, you know, using social media and just, you know, the internet isn't just for looking things up. It It's a platform. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Super interesting. So does that come into play clearly when evaluating whether or not someone qualifies as a world-renowned artist or entertainer? I would probably not be the best person to say <laughs> I'm not so up on. I was watching the Grammys and I was like, huh, they don't know who most of these people are. But that's not to say that if or when presented with the option option or opportunity to assist somebody, that I would I would go there. Mm -hmm. Much like I'm looking at when assessing, say, a scientist for an O1, I'm going to go and look at their their scholarly review articles and their influence there. So items that used to be less easy to find, there's, you know, we've got at our fingertips now mm -hmm. and anything that you can utilize to demonstrate the factors that USAIS is looking at that are tangible, that you can hold on to and are not, this person is great and and that's justified because I'm also great because look at my criteria, right? Well, true, when you're looking at a reference letter, having the numbers to back it up, it's kind of like when you're looking at how important a department or division is within a company, having that dollar bill sign behind it, it, it allows USPS to see the impact in a very clear way. Great. Uh, we have just a few more to get through. I know we are might run a few minutes over, but we're near the end. So the TN, mm -hmm. which was originally established as part of the North American Free Trade Agreement, um, which is actually just a revamp, mm -hmm. if you will. So what can you tell us about the TN and um, how it could potentially work for employers? So the TN, considering the original owner of it was NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, now it's USMCA, it's still between North American countries, so the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And specifically for our purposes, when we're advising clients for U.S. immigration, it's those individuals who are born in Canada or Mexico and have Canadian or Mexican citizenship are eligible to uh, benefit from a TN. TNs are typically professional occupations. However, unlike the E3s, the E2s, the all all categories for that matter, it's actually specific professions that qualify for TNs. So not only, it's not just all professional positions or uh -huh. all specialty occupations or, you know, specialized knowledge or the like, not without job titles specifically assigned to it. The TN, actually specific job titles are assigned. And so there are sort of two, new, two unique items behind it. So it's citizenship based, but it's also job based. And if the job doesn't fit, then you're looking at a situation where TN might not be, you might not be eligible for a TN. The one nice thing, particularly for Canadians, they can apply for a TN at the border. Mm -hmm. you get three years admitted to the United States. Uh, Mexicans do need to go to a U.S. consulate abroad to get the TN to come in. Um, and then it, it's extended either through USCIS or going back to U.S. consulate or a border indefinitely, which makes sense. I mean, the purpose is to, it's, it's sort of cultural purpose mm -hmm. for the underlying treaties and allowing for the individual to come to the United States on an as needed basis for an undetermined amount of time, but in specific increments makes sense. Uh, it's a nice perk to the particular TN visa. 
And I think that one of the items, very specifically, as I said, is it, it is limited. There, there are limiting factors. So the first limiting factor is you have to be Canadian or Mexican mm -hmm. citizen. And the second limiting factor is you have to have, you have to be a, a professional in the specific fields that have been predetermined. And so that is definitely unique. Uh, from a, you know, if I'm going to be nerdy here for a minute, from a <laughs> U.S. Uh, non-immigrant non work authorization perspective, and it's cer certainly important, as it always is, to speak to your attorneys mm -hmm. to discuss how or whether or not somebody qualifies. And that, I think, um, brings us to our next topic, which is we've all been talking about non-immigrant um, work authorization in the United States. And now we're looking at immigrant. We can run through these probably. We'll, we'll keep them pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And um, looking at the EB1 priority workers. So your multinational managers, your executives that qualify for L1As, uh, potentially qualify for this very high level employment based green card. In addition, your O1s potentially do. Um, because they're at that level within their industry or field that are at the top. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we go to uh, the, the eligibility on the next page, you'll see that it very much aligns with, with those non-immigrant visa classifications. Now, that is not to say just because you qualify for an L1A or an O1 or a P, like in your fantastic, doesn't mean inherently that you're going to qualify for an EB-1. Uh, these are hard to get. Mm -hmm. They require evidence and proof. And so, again, doing a deeper dive with your attorneys to discuss the option of pursuing this path. Um, but it is it is kind of nice. The reason being is in the other two employment-based um, green card processes that we're going to talk about, uh, there's not a labor market test where you don't have to go to, it's not the PERM, it's a two-step process. It's the I-140 filed with USCIS and, and then the green card application once the individual is eligible. So it kind of cuts out some of the mm -hmm. some of the steps of the process, some of the uncertainty, but then the uncertainty also lies with the fact that there's a higher level of scrutiny and there are more factors that you have to prove. The um, employment-based second preference are your advanced workers. There, there are certain... Uh, national interest waivers where there isn't a, a job or labor market test through PERM required. But for the most part, these are individuals who hold advanced degrees or at least the functional equivalent of an advanced degree, which is um, a, a single source master's degree uh, or a four year single source bachelor's degree plus five years of experience. Traditionally, what the individuals on the phone are likely used to uh, okay. for this um, employment-based second preference. It requires, in this instance, it would require a PERM recruitment, so that lends the uncertainty. Uh, but there is, with the way that green cards are distributed now, or at least immigrant visas, it's typically faster for most individuals to pursue and file for their green cards. And then finally, we have the employment-based third preference, uh, which are professionals or skilled workers. Uh, professionals, meaning uh, the, the job itself requires at least a bachelor's degree or two years of experience, and other workers are less than two years of experience required. Um, these are still, you can still obtain your green card through them. Uh, the, the time frames can be a little bit longer, uh, particularly for individuals from different, from certain countries with the way that immigrant visas are distributed. Nevertheless, we are in a situation where it puts the individual in line, mm -hmm. and hopefully that individual can ultimately benefit from uh, the process and, uh, you know, apply for and receive a green card. So while somebody may want to be EB1 or want to be EB2, the job offered to them is EB3. That's the path they're going to have to take, and while it may take a little bit longer, the positive thing is it's still a, a path mm -hmm. to ultimately obtaining a green card. Great. Thank you for that. I think that's our last slide, so I'm going to give a few minutes for any final questions. Excuse
excuse, maybe a brief pause while we sum through these. So there, there are we. The, the general question that was asked is minimum wage limitation for H1Bs. It depends on the position being offered, where that position is being offered, and what the actual wages are for the position itself within the company. Uh, typically, what is referred to as the prevailing wage. The example that I can provide in that instance is if the company typically pays. $65,000 for a software engineer in Des Moines, Iowa, and the prevailing wage for a software engineer in Des Moines, Iowa is $70,000, then the company would be obligated to pay the $70,000 because it's the higher the actual wage of the prevailing wage. Um, and the reverse is true. So while there are wage requirements for an H-1B, what it comes down to is not only assessing what the Department of Labor says the wage rates should be for that particular position, but also internally what the wage rates are for the positions being offered based on the individual's, um, what I can gather is experience and background, knowledge, et cetera. So that is a, it's a dual assessment and one that your attorney can walk you through. I think that there are um, certainly instances where we've seen, particularly in this day and age, with not being accepted into the HMB cap, if you have less than a 50% chance of being selected, you have to start thinking about backup plans now. And a lot of our multinational organizations and conversations we're, we're having now will talk about, okay, well, if this individual isn't selected in the cap this year, then they're going to need to go home November 1st, mm -hmm. which is the hypothetical, right? Um, and if you're a multinational organization, you've got the opportunity to potentially place an individual, say, in his or her home country where you have an, a subsidiary or an affiliated entity or a parent uh, for at least a year and then potentially have them come back on an L. I definitely counseled and work with companies who've done that. It does become tricky because a lot of the times uh, entities operate separately. So your entity in the UK may have different business plans and budgets than your entity in the United States. So it's really, I think if you've got those opportunities and you're concerned about some of your employees, certainly having that conversation now will go a long way so you can start planning. I think now is the time to plan. It's also the time to get the information in because we are real close to, to proceeding forward with the H-1B registration process. And so I would, I would certainly encourage you uh, to make sure that you are speaking to your immigration attorneys, particularly now. Mm -hmm. Time is of the essence. I wish that time was of the essence. We had a little more time, uh, but we're not. It's not the situation that we're we're operating under right now. And I just wanted to just provide that as an option. There there are always potential visa uh, alternative visa options, and that's just one way to think of it. Um, I think one. Question uh, that has also come up is just document retention, uh, specifically related to E3s, H1B1s, and H1Bs, as I said earlier, is the LCA requirement. Um, part of that requirement is completing, preparing, and retaining a public access file for at least one year after the expiration date of the LCA, it's the one year since its withdrawal. Um, or if you happen to find yourself in the Department of Labor investigation, which I hope nobody does, uh, until one year after that investigation has been closed. Uh, there are specific documentation requirements. Your attorney should be able to guide you as to what specifically needs to be in each public access file. It is certainly important to ensure, uh, just as a matter of course, that your public access files and even your perm audit files are up to date and complete, as that is a requirement from a legal perspective. Your attorney should have all the data and information as to what is needed and also how long you have to retain them. Yep. So I think that um, I think that 
from a can we answer these questions perspective, I think <laughs> we we've been able to do that. I also know that we are a little bit over on a little time, bit over on time. But uh, for the people who did ask, you will be receiving the recording from today's webinar as well as a copy of the slide deck and the SHRM and HRCI credits. So those will be forthcoming uh, sometime tomorrow. So to wrap things up, um, we do have a couple of more webinars coming up next week. We will be talking about working with hiring managers and sponsored talent to create a great employee experience. We're going to be speaking with um, Ray Kirby. He's a talent mobility manager at Nordstrom and has a lot of great insights. So we're really looking forward to that. And then on February 25th, we'll be talking about Canada as an H-1B alternative with our partner Mob Squad. So you can register for all of these webinars and see um, what's coming up in the month of March as well at envoyglobal.com slash webinars and events. And then if you're not already, make sure you're following us on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We post content pretty regularly as well as um, information about upcoming webinars and other great you know, blog content and policy updates. So make sure you're following along there. And again, these will be sent out to you tomorrow, but these are the Sherman HRCI credits. Sarah, thank you so much again for joining us today. I know welcome. this uh, presentation is always quite informative, so I appreciate you taking the time. Um, Alphabet soup. <laughs> everyone, enjoy the rest of your day, and we will be hopefully seeing you on here again soon. Thanks so much.